Okay, let's do this. Hello and welcome everybody. So excited to be here with all of you. My name is S.L. Ziegler. I'm the head of digital programs and services at LSU Libraries. And I'm the project manager for the LDLS data grant, which makes today's speaker series possible. By way of introduction, I'll say a few quick things about the grant and how the Louisiana Digital Library fits into it. Before that, though, a few housekeeping items. Um, the first being, I'll remind you that we all agree to the Code of Conduct, which states, in part, harassment of participants will not be tolerated in any form. So if we have to, we'll end this meeting, and Dr. Sutherland has agreed to record the presentation without a live audience. We, of course, hope it doesn't come to that, but there's no point in not having a plan. This talk is being recorded and will be available on the LDL YouTube channel. And we hope to have it up in the near future. We'll email all registrants when it's ready, as well as advertise it in all the usual ways. The recording will then live alongside the other great talks from the series. So if you haven't yet, we encourage you to take a look at those. And because this is being recorded, just taking a second to remind everyone that the chat is not private. So please, if you have something secret to say, use text or Slack or GChat. And like we say around here, if it's very bad, use Signal. So that being said, please do feel free to use the chat to ask questions or share resources. My colleague Leah Power Duncan will be helping us monitor these and share them out during the question and answer portion. Lastly, we'll be using this hashtag that you see here on the screen, LDLS data, should you want to contribute and, and or follow along on Twitter. So we're here together today because of the Collections as Data Part to Whole Grant with funds from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, re-granted through the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. LSU Libraries and the Louisiana Digital Library is part of a cohort charged with creating examples of how to operationalize the use of digital cultural heritage materials as data. We are thrilled to be part of this cohort. If you haven't yet had a chance to familiarize yourself with the other great projects involved, we do encourage you to do so at your convenience there with that URL. Our part of the Collections as Data Part to Whole project is in investigating what it would mean to make the entirety of the Louisiana Digital Library available as data. So for context, the LDL is Louisiana's statewide digital repository for cultural heritage material with over 30 participating institutions, including public libraries, academic libraries, archives, and museums. We know that our project, that a project of this scale and complexity will include both a technical angle in which we build out APIs and enable bulk downloads in various ways. And there's a lot of work to do in this area. But much more central to our project to date is the community work this entails. Because we're thinking about what we can get out of the LDL in terms of data to use and reuse in various formats and interfaces, we also need to think very carefully about what goes into the LDL. Doing so invites questions about digitization selection, conscientious metadata remediation, as well as evaluations of what collections should not, in fact, be widely shared, because we know that not everything should be treated the same way. And it's because of these questions and many others that we launched the speaker series, right? so we want to learn together. And because we know the LDL is not alone in this journey, we're so happy to see such a great turnout from beyond our state. Today's presentation had over 170 registrants from across the country and beyond. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to take a moment to invite you to attend our full speaker series. You can see the complete list of speakers at the URL listed here. I'll just talk briefly about the next one. On December 3rd, which is only two weeks from today, we'll be joined by Jessica Perkins Smith, University Archivist and Assistant Professor at Mississippi State University, whose talk, Digitizing Mississippi, Black Voices and White Supremacy, will explore the process of facing the history of Jim Crow era racism and finding ways to ensure stories of black resistance to white supremacy are illuminated, while at the same time creating the means for students and researchers to understand the fear and violence that allowed segregationists to maintain power so long in the state. I hope you'll be able to join us for this, as well as all the other great guests that you'll still be able to read about, again, using that link on the screen. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Tanya Sutherland. Dr. Sutherland is Assistant Professor at the Department of Information and Computer Sciences at the University of Hawaii Manoa. Before that, she was Assistant Professor at the College of Communication and Information Sciences at the University of Alabama. 
Dr. Sutherland holds a PhD and an MLIS from the University of Pittsburgh School of Computing and Informa Information and a BA in History, Performance Studies and Cultural Studies from Hampshire College. Her work focuses on the interactions of technology and culture, and as we're likely to see here today, emphasizes critical work within the fields of archival studies, digital studies, and science and technology studies. She has a forthcoming book entitled Digital Remains, Race and the Digital Afterlife, which I know will be of great interest to many of us here today, and I, for one, am eagerly awaiting its arrival. Lastly, I want to say here in public something that I had a chance to tell you, Dr. Sutherland, last time we spoke. Just before moving to Louisiana to work on the LDL, I had the good fortune of reading Archival Amnesty, an article that you published in 2017, and it has greatly shaped my view of what digital librarianship can and should be. So for that, thank you. And now I'm delighted to turn this over to you, Dr. Sutherland, and for all of us to hear about making culturally responsive decisions about redescription in the Louisiana Digital Library. Okay, thank you, SL. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Do this new year. Okay, so uh, you can see that I've shifted the title of my talk slightly, although I've not slipped, uh, shifted the contents much. Um, so. Um, Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, SL, for that introduction. And as SL said, my name is Tanya Sutherland. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an assistant professor of archival studies um, and digital culture studies in the Department of Information and Computer Science Sciences at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. It is an honor to be here with all of you today as part of the Louisiana uh, Digital Library Speaker Series. Before I begin, I'd like to take a moment to just note that I am joining you from the from Honolulu, Hawaii, where I am a guest and uninvited visitor on the unceded Aina of the Kanaka Maoli, or Native Hawaiian people. I would also like to briefly call upon the grace and guidance of my Afro-Caribbean ancestors from Trinidad and Tobago, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and St. Lucia, as I do this work with you today. Okay, so archives as a field has undergone several recent shifts. We've seen a new centering of local communities and their unique voices, um, needs and record keeping practices, an expanding of how archivists understand context to challenge the idea that um, context is always bounded and easily knowable. We've seen a re-examining of the role of the archivist and the possibilities and challenges inherent that are inherent in archival intervention. Um, and more recently, we've seen that archivists have been developing practices with an eye toward uh, harm reduction, such as community-centered archival description and archival redescription practices. So for example, in 2019, Alicia Chilcott, writing for um, Archival Science, suggested uh, moving toward protocols for describing racially offensive language in public archives in the UK. And that same year, Sam Frederick, writing for iJournal, urged archivists to focus on decolonization efforts by beginning with daily processes such as description. Along those same lines, uh, in the, the summer 2019 edition of the Society of Amer American Archivists uh, Descriptive Notes, the newsletter of the SAA description section focused almost entirely on accessible anti-racist community-centered description practices. The newsletter includes references to Archives for Black Lives Philadelphia's amazing work around community-centered description, um, and also a piece by archivist Courtney Dean, who uh, wrote about redescribing Japanese American collections at UCLA, and, and in which Dean reports on a pilot project to survey all of uh, the archival holdings um, documenting the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. Dean's project was really undertaken with the stated aim to audit archival description in finding aids for euphemistic language not in line with the preferred ter terminology advocated for by present-day Japanese-American community. 
these conversations about redescription are also happening alongside more informal conversations on social media. So for example, in 2019, Archives Twitter uh, had a conversation around um, the hashtag racist records. So I'd like to argue uh, that this turn toward rethinking description and developing redescription practices really speaks to a growing urgency in the profession to grapple with extant harmful and violent description and to remediate the harm caused by past descriptive practices. I would also argue that this theoretical shift and, and the factors that have influenced these changes in archival practice are really very wide ranging. So today I'm going to spend some time sharing some early findings from a pilot study that I conducted on sort of what animates archival uh, redescription practices, what, 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 what makes people want to do redescription um, on the ground. Uh, framing redescription as restorative justice, the larger study from wh of which this work is part, um, aims to increase the visibility and transparency of existing redescription practices, uh, identify how and why redescription practices are being engaged, assess the role of digitization as an impetus for redescription, engage and support cultural communities in advocating for preferred terminologies, and offer some guidance and assistance for archivists and other LIS professionals, information professionals who seek to implement best practices for redescription as restorative or reparative justice, repairing the harms embedded in their own collections. So I've prepared my talk in two parts. Um, in part one, I consider actions that were taken by four college and university archives as a result of the 2019 black and brown face scandals that caught institutional archives kind of off guard, including yearbook photos of Virginia Governor uh, Ralph Northam in blackface and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in brownface, just two of, of several such instances. Then in part two, I want to address some concerns around now digitized slavery era archives that adopt and reproduce the descriptive practices used by slave traders, slaveholders, and colonial officers. And then finally, I'll try my level best <laughs> to bring some of what I've learned from this research together in a way that will hopefully frame a fruitful and productive Q&A for us. In 2000, oh, yes. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, we're having, I think, a little bit of uh, noise coming through your microphone. OK. Um, Let me see if this helps. Does that help? I think it does. Okay. Thank you. I, you know, I apologize. Oh, not at all. Thank you for letting me know. OK. Um, in 2019, the library staff at a small private liberal arts college in the Midwest curated an historical mixed media exhibit of photographs and other memorabilia from student scrapbooks housed in the college archives. The exhibit followed the ongoing national debate surrounding offensive Halloween and party costumes, as well as a national effort to confront the history of blackface in university's yearbooks. A subsection of the exhibit explored the topic of parties of the past and highlighted the history of the college's social events dating back to the 1800s. Among the photos that were selected were two from a 1926 Halloween masquerade party that depicted a group of students, some of whom were wearing blackface. No context or description was provided for the materials in the exhibit. After the exhibit had been up for several weeks, a student complained to the library director about the blackface photos. Shortly after a conversation with the student, the library director decided to remove the photos showing blackface out of genuine concern for the student while also recognizing the current atmosphere of elevated sensitivity on many college campuses. So after the photos had been removed, the college provost ordered the remainder of the exhibit shuttered, closed. Uh, the library director was removed from campus and placed on administrative leave as a consequence of a grievance complaint pending an investigation. The library director was eventually reinstated to their position, but the case raised questions about censor censorship, academic freedom, and who should determine the appropriate remediation for offensive or racist materials in library and archival collections. So what are some of the larger questions at stake in this example? 
part of the controversy here and the, the justification for shuttering the exhibit involved a lack of what university administrators and some faculty called appropriate educational context, which raises the question for me, and I think maybe for all of us, of what counts as appropriate educational context when it comes to these kinds of racist and otherwise culturally insensitive materials. In February of 2019, another small private university carried out an audit of its archival materials, specifically its yearbook collection, at the direction of the university central administration, uh, the president's office, basically, uh, when it was noted that web traffic to its yearbook pages had seen a marked uptick in the wake of recent national controversy involving Virginia Governor Ralph Northam appearing in blackface in his college yearbook photos. So traffic to the site increased tenfold. To paint a really clear picture, during most months, the yearbook was typically downloaded 50 to 100 times. Um, in March of 2019, it got 1,101 downloads. During the audit, racist imagery was discovered in four campus yearbook editions, 1915, 1950, 1969, and 1985. In the 1985 yearbook, for example, blackface images can be found involving students dressed as celebrities, such as Lionel Richie, Ernie Hudson, who played the role of Winston in Ghostbusters, and Olympian uh, Carl Lewis. In April, the university president sent a campus-wide email announcing the temporary removal of the yearbooks uh, from the campus digital archives following the discovery of blackface photographs and other racially insensitive imagery. Hard copies of the same yearbooks remained available at the university library, however. The president emphasized that censorship was not the motive, but rather the goal was to properly contextualize and educate with the materials. Access to the digitized copies of the yearbooks in question was temporarily suspended, only to be returned roughly a week later with the blackface photos framed by new educational context, information on both the website access point uh, to the digitized materials and additional context provided for some, but not all, and I'll say more about that in a moment, of the yearbook PDFs. Understandably, debate and controversy ensued, in part because of the national context, the sort of national moment that was happening, and also in part because of the local context. The university in question had already convened a working group on slavery and its legacies, which was rooted in the library. The working group was not consulted as part of removing access to the racist records or to the provision of the ed educational context. In fact, the working group deemed the, deemed the action to temporarily remove the materials from the digital archives a concerning violation of ALA's code of ethics, noting that, quote, while we support the university president's goals of sharing educational information about history, about the history and practice of blackface, learning from this history and evolving as an institution in society, we cannot and do not support any erasure of institutional history, even if only temporarily. The library adheres to the American Libraries, uh, Library Association's Code of Ethics, in which we pledge to uphold the principles of intellectual freedom and resist all efforts to censor library resources." End quote. The group did, however, write the ensuing educational statement, which I've gone ahead and put on this slide for you so that um, you, can, you can read it in its entirety. So sort of further complicating this case, the PDFs of the entire yearbooks in question, so for example, the entire 1985 yearbook, were given this educational context statement that's on the screen right now. So if you went to the, the website and you uh, wanted to see the entire uh, PDF of the, of the 1985 yearbook, you would, you, would be, um, you, would, you would encounter this educational context statement first. However, portions of the yearbook can be as accessed as separate PDFs, and those individual files do not include the educational context statement. So rather, only the PDF um, of, that is of the yearbook in its entirety is given this context statement. So in other words, you can directly access right now, today, the section of the yearbook with the offending material, the blackface images, um, and, and other uh, racist imagery, um, and, and 
completely bypass this educational context statement because it was added to website access points and the PDF of the um, of the whole yearbook, but not to the PDF of the individual um, pages or yearbook subsections, which are of course all readily discoverable through the library search interface. This has the potential to be an implementation error that will become epic at scale when it comes to adding educational context statements as redescriptive or remediative measures. So something for us to think about. While the parties of the past case involved analog materials and analog display practices, the temporarily withdrawn case discussed here involves analog and digitized materials, with the digitized materials and digital access becoming the core of the controversy. In this regard, the cases together add to our, our understanding that such controversies can uh, involve both analog and digitized materials, um, although they're often treated unequally. Also of interest is that both cases involve private universities and thus private records of what are otherwise very public histories, uh, violences, and traumas. Um, both the parties of the past and the temporarily withdrawn cases involve a question of what counts as appropriate educational context, appropriate context. But there's a noticeable struggle here in this temporarily withdrawn case as to, as to how to describe what was happening to the records. Words like temporarily removed, pulled, withdrawn are used interchangeably and frankly often mistakenly because we're really talking about digital access points, not necessarily um, access to the files themselves or to the materials themselves. So is there maybe a need here to standardize the terms and the vocabulary used by LIS professionals for redescription and other descriptive mediation remediation practices? During the academic year 2011-2012, the student newspaper at a mid-sized university in the Northeast formed an archives committee and began the process of digitizing its newspaper archives. Coordinated by a small committee of student newspaper alumni and staff, the initiative aimed to digitize every year, every paper, every semester of its archival holdings. So now fast forward to February 2019 and the nationwide yearbook contra controversy that informed our prior two cases. And in response to this controversy, the staff at the student newspaper set out to conduct their own review of their campus yearbooks. By April of that year, the student newspaper had published a story detailing their findings, which were drawn from a survey of the campus archives, and, um, and the article confirmed that the national trend had touched their campus as well. That same month, the student newspaper also published a statement from its editorial board about discovering racist and offensive content within back issues of the newspaper itself, a discovery the editorial board attributes to the collision of its investigation of the campus yearbooks with its own upcoming move to a, uh, a together with its own upcoming move to a new location on campus. So preparing for the move involved handling the archives in a new way. And uh, that was that was part of how um, the material the, the racist records were discovered. So the editorial board of the student newspaper announced plans to carry out a comprehensive investigation of the newspaper's own archives over the you know, 2019-2020 academic year, so this, um, this past academic year, with no mention of having spent much of the past decade digitizing these same materials, um, the same historical editions of the newspapers, and sort of no explanation as to why the racist content wasn't noticed or discovered sooner though say through say the process of digitization um, so while it is my position that the, the that these racist records that were uncovered likely became newly perceivable as uh, as such amid a nationwide scandal and controversy about racist records it seems hard to believe some of the newspaper's racist records were not previously encountered over years of active digitization which involves support from from LIS experts on campus that's something I think to pay attention to. 
This is a, this case is a story of ripple effects. Uh, the discovery of racist records within the student newspaper archives was partly attributed, at least publicly, to the initial investigation of the university's yearbooks, which are held elsewhere in special collections. The student newspaper uh, operated independently from the university. So this again raises a question for me, how could it be that uh, the digitization of the newspaper's archives hadn't already uncovered or sort of unsettled these, these materials in the newspaper archives? Might, might there be a need for new frameworks, guidelines, and content flagging tools for redescription and other remediations or interventions at the digitization stage of, of projects? So both the temporarily withdrawn and the parties of the past cases really engage the question of what counts as appropriate context. These same concerns do not actually seem to animate the student newspaper case, although this could become important when the student newspaper makes future digitization and access decisions about the newspaper. Will one potential outcome of the, of the you know, 2019-2020 academic year review of the student newspaper archives be a push to create contextual or explanatory uh, contextual or explanatory framework for the digitized copies of the newspaper. And is this the best way forward? Is are these educational statements, um, you know, the, the best that we can do in terms of of, uh, of remediation? It's not really clear. Um, if or what Special Collections plans to do about the racist content in the university yearbooks or about any of its uh, any other potentially racist records in its holdings. Uh, my research did not uncover any kind of official statement, plan, apology, uh, or discussion along the lines of repair or, um, or, uh, or, or, or um, yeah, or remediation. Um, yeah, and then nothing sort of along the lines of what unfolded in the first two cases. Instead, this case seems to be one of administrative silence. So how then does the discovery of, of, of racist and other otherwise um, objectionable records affect digitization decisions? Will, will the LIS professionals uh, who are working on digitizing the student newspaper and, and, and the folks at the university factor the presence of racist and offensive content into future discussions of digitizing the yearbooks? In February 2019, it was a really hot month for all of this, I'm telling you. Another small private university in the Northeast learned that a college yearbook photo might be used as part of national reporting by USA Today on blackface in college yearbooks. As part of the investigation, USA Today affiliates contact, conducted a review of yearbooks from 1975 to 1985 at a number of local colleges and universities and found a spectrum of racist images. Photos found included Ku Klux Klan costumes, a number of students in blackface. Um, the university in question immediately responded by issuing a twofold apology from its president. The first part said, it has come to our attention that both national and local media outlets soon will publish stories referencing racist yearbook photos from college campuses across the country. A photo taken from a student produced university yearbook from the late 1970s uh, may be included in the articles. A number of offensive photos had previously been removed from online versions of the college yearbook, but they remain in the hard copy versions. So again, the decision here was to withdraw um, what they had already discovered rather than repair or remediate. The second statement said, these highly offensive photos, which appeared in an old student publication, should have been completely unacceptable back then. Today, we condemn them in the strongest possible terms. They do not represent our institutional values, nor reflect our efforts to make our university a more diverse and inclusive campus. We remain deeply committed to maintaining a safe and supportive environment with policies that promote dignity and respect for all individuals. Later that month, the university in question removed all digital copies of its yearbook from its website after a media request for comment on the Ku Klux Klan costume photo in the college yearbook. 
um, those uh, those digital copies of the yearbook have not been made accessible again. So they pulled them and they have not put them back up. As digitized records have been front and center within recent nationwide controversies over racist records, raising important questions about why the materials were not discovered sooner, um, do LIS professionals on the front lines of digitization have the knowledge, skills, and abilities that we require to identify racist records before these records even become a matter of public controversy or cens censorship? Presumably, had these records been flagged sooner, perhaps at the digitization stage, the outcomes of these cases might have been different. The institutions themselves might have been spared considerable embarrassment and individuals spared considerable harm. So what aspects of current digitization practice are preventing LIS professionals on the front lines of digitization projects from discovering racist records earlier? You know, for that, by that I mean sort of in the upstream process as part of the digitization process. Is it because we are outsourcing our digitization practices? Is it because we have to, um, in many ways, focus on cost and speed? Is it, um, is it automation? Is it because we've autom automated some of our digitization? How could it be that LIS professionals had not previously encountered the racist records in these cases where digitized copies are at the heart of the controversy? So I'm gonna leave you with these questions as we move on to part two, but I'd like to come back to them during our discussion later in our Q&A. Okay. So I'm gonna shift gears now and bring in some broader and perhaps in parts more theoretical concerns. You'll see in my slides that I'm referencing some examples from the Louisiana Digital Library, which is among the increasing number of digital archives, libraries, databases, and other um, projects that include materials from the era of chattel slavery in the United States. These digital undertakings are beginning to transform how we collectively understand the history of human enslavement, and they are also raising a new set of concerns about archival practices like description. While digitization in this case offers broad access to important information about enslaved people, uh, including rare records about birth, life, and death, social and cultural customs and norms, disease and illness, and so much more, the uncritical reproduction of violent and harmful descriptive practices must be critiqued through a critical race studies lens. Interrogating descriptive practices as extensions of whiteness, one might ask, what does it mean for someone who holds and thinks about black people as the other to describe or narrate the experience of, of chattel slavery, of black people during chattel slavery? How do these descriptive practices yanked from a violent past interfere with black life and normalize black death in the present? And what narratives and counter narratives emerge from these descriptive practices? And how might these narratives contribute to our understandings of black life in the present? A critical race analysis of extant descriptive practices around slavery era records necessarily raises questions about whiteness, about power, about violence and harm, about inclusion and exclusion, and eventually about how more quantitative approaches and a turn to datification more generally as a result of digitization might transform how we understand the era of chattel slavery in the United States. As digitization leads to the construction of more slavery studies databases like the North American Slave Narratives Database, for example, which requires users to search holdings according to local descriptive practices, researchers have found themselves searching for terms that have long been considered outdated, offensive, violent, and harmful. Jessica Marie Johnson, in her 2018 article, Markup Bodies, Black Life Studies and Slavery Death Studies at the Digital Crossroads, argues that these databases also often reinscribe the biometric measures used to describe enslaved people by carrying the racial nomenclature of the time period, such as mulatto and octoroon, into the present and work to encode skin color, hair texture, height, weight, age, and gender in new digital forms, replicating the surveilling actions of slave owners and slave traders. This leads to what Sadia Hartman calls a second order of violence, whereby the people already harmed by descriptive archival practices are again harmed, while also becoming a new form of datafied and quantifiable raw material from which new value can be extracted. 
This is what I call the digital afterlives of slavery era archives. And it is one of the ways that black people continue to be commodified in this country. Along with Johnson, Simone Brown and Jackie Wernemont have also argued that data is deeply embed embedded in colonial histories of quantification that have a defining moment in the accounting and marking of enslaved bodies. Johnson further argues that if left unaddressed, the violence of these archival processes can reproduce themselves in the digital architecture. So too frequently digital archives um, mirror the organization of information as it already exists, rather than taking up the goal of reorganization or redescription. So in now digitized slavery era archives, this means that archivists have uncritically adopted and reproduced both structures of knowledge organization and descriptive practices used by slave traders, slaveholders, and colonial officers. While Nicole Hannah Jones's very impressive New York Times Magazine undertaking the 1619 project aims to reframe the country's history, understanding 1619 as our true founding and placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the very center of the story we tell ourselves about who we are, not all projects have such noble goals. Um, so in the, the last uh, sort of case that I'd wanna discuss today, two images long stored away in an institutional attic are now also subject to new digital afterlives. Two daguerreotypes commissioned by uh, Louis Agassi, Aga Agassiz, a Swiss born zoologist and Harvard professor who is sometimes called the father of American natural science um, uh, and taken in 1850 by uh, JT Zeely in a studio in Columbia, South Carolina have come to national attention because of their digital afterlives. The daguerreotypes feature images of an enslaved man and an enslaved woman, Renty and Delia, who were among seven enslaved people who appeared in 15 images made using the daguerreotype process, which for those unfamiliar with the form is an early type of photography um, imprinted on silvered copper plates. The images of Renty and Delia are haunting and experiencing them feels very sort of voyeuristic as Renty and Delia stare at the camera with, with very detached expressions. Tamara Lanier, who's pictured here, um, has through deep genealogical research identified the people in these images as family ancestors. And she's filed a lawsuit for their return, marking the first time the descendant of an enslaved person in the United States might be granted return of property rights. Held by uh, Harvard University, however, the daguerreotypes are highly contested records. After a long period during which they were believed to have been lost, Harvard has since used the daguerreotypes, um, the worn and weary faces of Renty and Delia on book covers, on event banners, and on other forms of advertising and merchandise. Tanahasi Coates, well known for his article on the case for reparations, has said of the images of Renty, that photo of the image of Renty, that photograph is like a hostage photograph. This is an enslaved black man with no choice being forced to participate in white supremacist propaganda. That's what that photograph was taken for. Closely associated with the daguerreotypes are the inventories of enslaved people that have also been published online in the time since the case came to national attention. Used in part to verify Lanier's ancestral claims to the daguerreotypes, these inventories are replete with all of the problems previously noted about knowledge organization and descriptive practices. While datification and quantification might be lesser concerns in this case, commodification is a considerable worry as Renty and Delia have moved to digital platforms where death and trauma are continuously reinscribed and re-experienced visually and perhaps eternally. Scholars such as Sophia Noble have written on the political economy of black death. And I have previously argued that there are political, social and economic gains to be made by reinscribing historical reminders of the conditions of black people's deaths. These descriptive records serve as a means of power and control. A powerful reminder that one must be ever vigilant, one must be hyper aware and one must be ever in fear for one's life. 
While on one hand, the mass digitization of slavery era records holds both the promise of new historical knowledge and of genealogical reconstruction for descendants of enslaved people. On the other hand, this trend belies a growing tendency to reinscribe racist ideologies, codify damaging ideas about how we organize and create new knowledge, codify harmful descriptive practices, and uncritically circulate records rooted in generational trauma, hatred, and genocide. When it comes right down to it, the archives of Atlantic slavery were created by colonizers and slaveholders. And so rather than being faithful representations of the colonized and the enslaved, they are a deeply complex, fraught, and often problematic set of sources that speak to how archivists hold, produce, and reproduce agency, privilege, and power. The mass digitization and datification of slavery era archives has arguably con contributed to a distancing of the lived experiences of enslaved people from slavery's historical imaginary. Because of the significant temporal gap between the violence of the past and the visual experience of the present, when slavery era records are digitized en masse, records appear and circulate in different contexts. This decontextualization removes the immediacy of trauma, giving records that document that trauma new afterlives, often independent of their historical context. Redescription and descriptive remediation offer us an opportunity to repair some of this trauma, to use intentional language, to better understand kinship relationships, to be better listeners in our communities. So beyond the cases already presented and discussed here, I do wanna take a little bit of time to acknowledge that there are several repositories that have begun to embrace redescription as uh, archival best practice. Um, an informal survey of practicing archivists in late 2019 that, that I conducted uh, revealed several redescription projects um, that have been undertaken over the past 15 years or so. So as early as the mid 2000s, staff at the Clements Library at the University of Michigan conducted a redescription project that focused on, uh, on uh, gender. More recently, the Claremont Colleges, as part of a collections as data grant from, from the Mellon Foundation, have begun to collaborate with community partners to attach appropriate indigenous place names to roughly 13,000 digital files of mixed archival materials, including journals, ledgers, correspondence, field notes, and maps documenting the history of water use in Southern California. Um, the University of Montana is reported to have done some redescription work on their Native American collections, as has the Center for um, Native American Indi and Indigenous Research at the American Philosophical Society. Princeton University Special Collections Division has done important work contextualizing and offering interventions to problematic terminology. Um, in their finding aids, uh, drawing from the work of Archives for Black Lives Philadelphia, um, and working to ensure that predominantly Spanish language collections have predominantly Spanish language finding aids. Um, Archivists at the University of California, Riverside have experimented with using uh, computational scripts to audit existing descriptive practices, while archivists at the University of Texas, Austin have argued for redescription, noting that uh, titling files accurately but failing to uh, provide contextual description is dangerous and that assumptions of neutrality create bi biases in favor of historical racism. And then finally, the work done by the Archives of Traditional Music at Indiana University, new uh, redescription work being undertaken by the Brooklyn Historical Society and a small pilot project um, by the University of Houston Libraries have focused on metadata redescription for slavery era records. Um, and that sort of represents some of the current work that's being done on developing best practices for and implementing instances of archival redescription. So from the black and brown face scandals that have caught off guard, archives off guard, your book photos uh, that a Canadian prime minister um, to the now digitized slavery era records uh, that tend to mirror descriptive practices as they already exist. Um, 
I think archivists and archival studies scholars have begun to name and identify a growing tendency to reinscribe racist ideologies and codify damaging ideas um, about how we organize and create knowledge as, as a drawback of digitization, right? So the access afforded by the public by digitization practices has arguably rendered archival description too visible to not take seriously calls to remediate harm through our through redescription practices. And you'll see here that I've, I've used uh, an example from, from LDL with uh, a notice of um, a, a, a sort of an educational context warning. Okay, so I'm gonna close and say that what I have observed in the holdings and descriptive practices at the Louisiana Digital Library is an unsurprisingly uneven handling of remediative uh, redescription. With aggregation projects such as LDL, it is particularly difficult to apply descriptive best practices consistently, much less an undertaking such as redescription. Based on my research, however, I can make one simple recommendation. Redescription is worth the effort. Uh, whether you decide to set policies for descriptive standards that must be met before acceptance into the repository, or you just decide to conduct an audit of extant description in your holdings, redescription is reparative work, it's reparations work. It works to repair harm, to heal past offenses, and to help us all move forward. It is the work of justice. Thank you. I know that it often takes a little bit of time for everybody to uh, come up with a question. So I will um, go ahead and ask one, Tonya, if you don't mind. Um, I would, um, by way of, I guess, discussion, I'm very interested in your questions about, um, about uh, why it is that LIS professionals aren't identifying material at the point of digitization. And of course, right, I'm, I'm one of the, you know, I'm, I'm speaking from, from the group that, that I, I would like questions about. And, you know, thinking back on my own time as, as somebody who, who did act digitize daily, um, I have my own thoughts, but I'd love, I'd love to hear, um, since you, you know, since you think so much about it, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, I mean, I do think that um, I think I think part of it is process, right? And I, I do think some of it is it's it's about cost and speed. Um, so if if you are if you are digitizing at scale, um, you know, or or you're outsourcing or sending your entire collection of your books out to be digitized, then you you don't have eyes and hands on those materials at the point where you could um, potentially make an intervention. By the same token, I think it's not something that people have been looking for, right? I think it's also partly an awareness issue. And so that's part of the reason that I'm doing this work because I, you know, it, yes, um, would undertaking a redescription project for your entire uh, archival repository be costly and time consuming? And is that something that we worry about as professionals in the field? Absolutely. Um, but, you know, again, I think if, if you can, if, if you are already conducting some kind of an audit or a survey of your collections, include that in your audit or your survey, right? Um, if you have time to audit or survey portions of your collection, then, you know, you slowly make your way through it. There's, um, it, it's, it's just, it's something that I think we, we can no longer kind of afford to ignore. But I'd love to hear from other people who do digitization work um, and, you know, what, what you think some of those barriers are or uh, what might be sort of um, standing in the way of, of, of that intervention at that moment. And I see Noah and I kind of want to point to you because I know that you've been doing some of this work, um, but I won't, I won't, <laughs> I, won't uh, I won't call you out specifically, even though I just did. So maybe as we think through barriers to this work, there's a question from Miriam Childs. Um, she says the law library has contributed the digital version of a ledger book called the governor's order book. It's likely there's some language in the orders that is offensive. 
what would be the recommendation to re-describe the record for the book? Um, I'd have to look at it, um, but so, I mean, what, so I mean, I'd have to look at the description that, that, that the extent, the existing description, but um, what I've seen is, is sort of two, two sort of big uh, ways forward. One is to provide this sort of context, right? This, this note or, um, or colophon or wh whatever you might want to call it that says, this, this material might be offensive, right? Um, sort of, a, you know, a, a, a warning, right? Or a, a, an educational content note is typically what they're, they're referred to as, or context note. And the other is to take up the practice that um, Archives for Black Lives Philadelphia has really kind of um, done just outstanding work uh, with their with their suggestions for how to be more active in 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 changing language from 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 passive description to active description, active voice. Um, so you know this um, this person um, wasn't a slave; they were enslaved by someone, right? So it's 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 about carefully. Um, changing the language to more closely reflect what actually happened. Mm -hmm. um, Carly is asking if there are distinctions between the framings of what you call redescription versus remediation versus reparative description. That's a really good question. Um, for me, redescription, I think is the, I think the reparative description, reparative description is kind of the umbrella term. Redescription implies that for me that you are taking an existing, so kind of like what Princeton did, making sure that their finding aids that are for Spanish language materials are their finding aids are finding aids are also in Spanish language. Like that is completely redoing the existing description. Um, and then the, uh, the, the sort of remediative work, I think, can be done um, in other parts of the metadata. And, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily require that you rewrite the whole finding aid, but that you add a note or, or, or do some reparative work in terms of, of the language that's there. Mm -hmm. um, maybe similarly, can you clarify what you mean by intervention? Um, should we not place these items online? Is contextual description enough? Ooh, that's a very good question. It's a very good question, and it's one that I am still wrestling with. Um, you know, it, I don't, I don't. The materials exist. I think if they're going to be digitized and uh, put online, then they need to be given that context and the proper the proper description. And you know, going back to what SL said at the beginning, not everything is is for everyone all the time, right? So there might be instances where no, something shouldn't go up online. Um, it shouldn't be made accessible where it can circulate out out of its original context and. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't want to be the final arbiter on, on those decisions, but um, I do think it's a conversation we need to have as a field. Mm -hmm. And someone's noting um, something I've also observed and wondered about. It seems like archives are doing more of this work than libraries. Um, do you see that too and have any ideas of why that would be? Um, I, f I do see that too, um, but also I'm looking through a somewhat myopic lens because I, I, you know, I come through archival studies, although um, I am in, you know, a broader LIS scholar um, and um, have worked in, in both arenas and in, in libraries and in archives. Um, I think it's because archives deal with unique materials. I really think that that's why, um, you know, um, with with library materials, you're doing a lot of copy cataloging, and certainly we know that Library of Congress subject headings could use some 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 repair work themselves, right? So I'm not saying that there isn't harmful that there aren't harmful descriptive practices in in libraries, but um, this and that redescription shouldn't be happening or or couldn't be happening in in libraries as well. Um, but I think I, my my sense is that it's the 
it's the original materials and the um, the amount of descriptive work that goes into um, archival collections or archival uh, materials. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna go, we're gonna unmute Noah. Um, he has some ideas. <laughs> Yeah, so I just I, I wanted to respond to the question about what what prevents um, LAS workers who are working directly with these materials for digitization from surfacing some of these issues sooner. Um, and I think um, I think there's a lot of factors at play. Um, I would say one of the biggest ones is simply that the folks doing the direct work are often not empowered to raise these issues within the institutional context. So I know, for example, at my institution, UC Riverside, um, the physical work of digitization is e either done by outside vendors or by undergraduate student workers. Um, and in the case of outside vendors, um, there's no communication between us working in the library and the people who are physically digitizing the materials. Um, you know, there's just talk with a, vendor rep about sending the materials and making the payment. So it may be that those people are noticing things and, and having thoughts and feelings about them that there's simply no, no channel and no uh, power for them to raise those issues. Um, and with when it's done in-house by, by undergrad students, um, again, those channels of communication aren't generally built into the way uh, that the work is done. I know I had experiences as a student um, who was scanning where I would come across something, but I wouldn't, you know, I would be working pretty independently. I wouldn't know, oh, should I email my boss about this? Is this a big deal? Um, that kind of thing. You know, I know that I don't directly supervise the student workers, but um, do collaborate with them. So when we've had particular uh, collections that I had concerns about, um, especially for a couple of years, there was a student working with us who had an ethnic studies background and was really interested in, in some of these issues around archives and memory, I would personally make an effort to check in with them uh, about the materials. But even at my level as, uh, as a metadata librarian, where I'm often handling the, the ingest and the description of the materials, so I'm kind of, especially if they've been digitized externally, I may be the first person who's looked at these materials in, uh, at our institution in a number of years. Um, I still run into the same issues where I feel like I'm not always empowered to raise something uh, without potentially getting a lot of backlash from administration or having, um, you know, having it be really not handled in a nuanced way once it once it's seen as something that raises the red flags at the central admin level, it's uh, tends to be kind of an all or nothing approach where either let's delete this forever and, you know, or no, to do anything, putting up more context would be censorship. Uh, you know, it, it feels like it can spiral out of control really quickly. And, and again, as the person raising it, it can sometimes attract unwanted attention. Uh, I think that as these issues come up more, I also, I wonder somewhat about the role of, um, at least for those of us who are unionized, um, what the role of our unions might be in being able to support and protect us during this work because I, I have had the experience of it bringing um, pretty significant backlash. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Noah. Yeah. We are coming up on time. There are more questions in the chat. Do we want to take some more? Dr. Sutherland, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you're willing to, to do another question. Or I can definitely take another question or two. Mm -hmm. um, Keila has mentioned that she thinks library catalogers often limit themselves to Library of Congress subject headings and that the closed nature of these catalogs limits flexibility. Um, and hopefully when libraries embrace linked data more fully, we can be more flexible, um, more agile when language changes acceptable terms. An excellent point. Um, Agility is very important, agree, agree. Some libraries and archives are coming up with their own 
reparative language lists for descriptive metadata instead of using Library of Congress headings? Are there any that you found that you could point us to that are publicly available? I would again really point you toward um, Archives for Black Lives Philadelphia's work. Um, and I can um, stop sharing. I can drop it in the chat, um, the, the link to to the to the PDF. Um, it's really it, and you know they got community feedback, which is another thing I was going to say that I would really very strongly recommend. You know when I said I wouldn't want to be the final arbiter of this, and that it's a conversation that we need to have as a field. I also think it's something that needs. It's also a conversation that needs to be had in community with um, people who are impacted and influenced by the description, the descriptive work that that we do. Um, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Got a couple of just great comments, Sherry notes that it does seem to me that there is a lot of activism within the library community to try and change standards and create alternate vocabularies. Um, and Jessica speculates that if these issues are disproportionately identified by BIPOC workers, identifying the problem may place the onus on them to fix the problem, which may be undesired labor put on these folks. Agree. Agree. That is, that is in fact often uh, a danger, right? Of being the person to point out a problem that, and you know, this sort of runs the gamut that you you point out the problem and then you are asked to fix it. Um, and I think that when it comes to um, materials that might be racially or culturally sensitive or or offensive, um, it is in, in fact Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who are asked to do that remediative and repair work for ourselves. And you know, that's problematic mm -hmm. also. Definitely. Um, uh, Dr. Sutherland, if you don't mind, just one more question. Um, I, I'm sort of wondering, so like as we're pointing out, there's a lot of activism in the field right now. Um, a lot of us are working at, on this from different angles. Do you have a sense of how we could go about building best practices? Like what, what it would look like to get from where we are to, to that point? That is exactly the reason that I'm that I took up took this up as a as a research study. Um, I you know I want to be in conversation with people. I'd like to be in conversation with people who are doing this work. I want to I want us to be having that conversation together. And so I'm hoping to um, to do some interviews and and to um, collect some data and you know be able to share that back out with people and you know sort of sort of conduct it as a community engagement type project because I do also like within our field I, I also see that activism um, and I agree SL it's coming from from so many different places and uh, people are taking up different pieces of it and I think you know um, if we can if we can pool that knowledge and, and pool our resources we actually might be able to affect some change um, meaningful change and uh, put forward a set of, of, of at least guiding principles, if not best practices. Fantastic, thank you. And I, I, I see that we've gone a couple of minutes without more chat questions. So this is probably a good time to again, thank you, Dr. Sutherland very much. This was absolutely fantastic. And to uh, thank it's everyone. been such a pleasure, thank you. And, and also to thank all the participants. Um, again, we will send this out the video out, I should say, um, shortly, and everyone can, can rewatch it because there was just so much information. But again, so very <laughs> thankful. Everybody have a wonderful day.